This is the sixth lesson in this series. It can also be heard on tape number 602F. Cosmic Consciousness, Lecture 6, Saturday, October 18th, 1969, 1 and 7 8 speed, Dr. E. W. Blyton. Jerry and I are going to sit down and do a little work uh, because we haven't been able to get to do it because of just that. <clears throat> the soul rises up to God. She becomes godlike and able to know the above and the below. She then turns the power to heal disease, to make useful inventions, to institute wise laws, and man has of himself no intuitive power of his own. His intuition is the result of the connection existing between his soul and the divine spirit. The stronger his, this union grows, the greater will be his intuition or spiritual knowledge. Not all of perception of the soul are of a divine character. There is also many images which are the products of the lower activities of the soul in her mixture with material elements, material forces, in other words. Divine nature being the external fountain of life produces no descriptive images, but if her activity is perpetual, such deceptive images may appear. If the mind of man is illumined by the divine light, the ethereal vehicle of this soul becomes filled with that light and shining. We have been talking about cosmic consciousness, and I feel yet that you do not know what we are talking about. I am going to give a demonstration or an example of such so that you may get a concept to work with. I cannot describe it, but I will bring it about in your mind, because my consciousness cannot be your consciousness until you have absorbed it. Now, if we took a pot of gold and put it on the corner of the Visadero and... Uh, 8th Street, for instance. And nobody knew we had put it there. And then I took three different men. I sent one from here, and I gave him a description of the streets and distances to get to there. And I took somebody from, from uh, another place and started him at the coffee shop and gave him a description to get there. And then I took... Uh, Maybe Denise and started her from from uh, 937 Fillmore and gave her a description to get there. They would have a perfect description of a way, but would they know what they were looking for? Would they know what the, what was there when they got there? They wouldn't have any knowledge that the pot of gold was there. They wouldn't have any knowledge of what they would find when they got there. Now, if I took any one of you and ran you over all three of those same routes, describing where you went and how far and so forth, and you followed them, all three, and the experience you had on the way there, when you got there, if you didn't think too much about the details, you might experience and find the gold. The gold is the cosmic consciousness. 
And that is the way in which we, and the only way in which I can convey cosmic consciousness to you, consciousness to you. Because there is no description of it. There is no way to find it. There is only a way of leading you toward it. And when you get there, you'll then experience something that you have never experienced before. It can't be described. Those of you who have had any deep meditation and have experienced the art of meditation truly, I'm not talking about thoughtless thinking. I mean meditation. And if you later have learned to, for instance, leave the body at any time or have been taken out, you will know that between here and the next stop, there was a place that seemed to be nothing. And that place that seemed to be nothing left sort of an imprint upon your mind because there was a question as to what it was. Because when you move from one level of vibration or consciousness to another, it seems that the unknown part or space, and which I can't use the word, neither time, because it isn't, that you move through from one place into another leaves the greatest imprint. That is cosmic consciousness. For it is at the point of no reality in your words and thinking because it is not of the material world and it is not necessarily of the heaven world. It is the consciousness of the divine creator and therefore it is not there. It is, though, where the other does not exist. And thus it cannot be described or the experience which you receive or experience cannot be described because no man's experience will be the same. But whatever it is that you experience will be of vital importance to you. And as far as I'm concerned, you can throw it in the trash basket after you get through with it. If you do, throw it away because it's of no use to me either. So don't try to tell your brother if you have it what your experience is because it's useless and will only probably be harmful to him. But is very important to you. I can know of no other explanation. And this is why I brought up the subject of keeping notes on things that express something to you because you can explain it to yourself on paper but that same explanation would be nothing to me or anyone else. because it is the lack in you of what is in the Creator. So that's a pretty big order. And it is the way you will be shown to get to it. When one has adapted themselves and reach the perfection of the reality of this, and I say adapted because I mean 
you have got to get rid of all your little petty larceny ideas because in here there is no place for your ideas. They have no place. Neither is there any of mine. And there's no place for your opinions because you don't have any opinions that are worth anything on this level. You be careful, something will get home to you. This will mean something to you. That's the first indication we always get in a new student. They go to sleep when it starts to hit home. And the reality of the thing is that I am not interested in what you need in accordance with the cosmic level because I can't give you orders that way. I can't lay the path. You can only lay that path through that revelation within yourself. Out of the self comes truth. That's truth and direction. But most of us, even with our most accurate understanding and our getting out of the way humanly, we still get some little uh in there somewhere when we get something out of the self, even. Which can be done and is being done. So it is necessary for us to find a way. If we are going to advance to the point where we will know something within ourselves, not out of a book, because books don't know anything about this. Because you can study until you've got old gray white hairs and you'll never know a thing about this. But only through our work. Work, spiritual work, can we reach the point where we can gain a true understanding of our own path. Now this same thing happens in prophecy because there are a lot of prophets sometimes spring up in different ages, in different times. But the trouble with the prophet, usually, is that he'd like to get his name on the prophecy just in case it was right. Just in case it was right. Because most of them are not sure enough of the things which they are giving forth. In the common practice to find a person closing their eyes when they are concentrating, either in thinking or listening, rapid impressions that are made on the eyesight, and I want to give you this one over again. There's a little bit of it I used before, but not all of it. I said, as we sit in any room, are often disturbing to the processes of concentration. And the general visualization, a person in visualizing, a person in concentration, we come up with this same image. And we mention here Rodin's Thinker and stories of the West and the boy who... Uh, saw the Indians. Now, this I want to enlarge on just a little bit because this is, again, a fallacy of your own mind. You, as an individual, never do any thinking really until you have reached a point 
where you are using no process or approach. When you've decided that you don't know and there is no process or approach, then you will be able to think. Because thinking is not done in direction. Contrary to some of the psychological approaches of it, it is not done in direction. Because if you have a direction in which you are thinking, then you are imaging the thoughts that you want. And when you do this, you have no correlation within your own consciousness. It is already correlated. You've already determined it. And that is why it is essential for all leaders, all teachers, whether it be just Bible class or otherwise, to get to the point where they realize that if they're going to do any true thinking, they don't start with their opinion. They let loose of everything, and that which comes, and that which is in the mind, that which has been within the mind of their own subconscious, and out of this, then when they do this, this they will get correlation from. Or if they are reading something out of this book, this book, this book, and this book, if they read it without thinking about it, and then pose the question, they will get a correlation of this, an integration of the entire thing, and, an a and they will get a true thinking a true thought, a true, call it diagnosis of words if you want to, it might be a good application of that word. Because otherwise they're doing channeled things. Now a stubborn person is nothing more than a guy that has already determined what he's going to think about. And say, hell or high water, He's going to think about that anyway. And that's all there is to it. So never argue or debate philosophy or anything else with a man that's made up his mind. Let him go ahead and bang his head against the wall, then talk to him. Because the hurt that he gets will make an opening so you can speak to him and then he'll listen. I've done this many times in school, and I'm sure you're sure you've seen some of it happen. But you've got to wait until he has stopped running his course. And when he's got a hard enough thump, <coughs> this will give him something to put his mind on, and then you can inject a little, some tr little truth that will sink in, it will slide by you see. It'll get home. This is a point, you might say, of material cosmic consciousness. Because you are so engrossed with something else that you really don't have any opinion at the moment. The intelligent soul substance received from the Logos and the inseparable immaterial body and thus en and entered thus into being. She is, therefore, neither corporal nor incorporal. Well, why she? Because all beings are he or she, and she, rather, he and she. They are both male, female. So we speak about this in creation because all things are creating, aren't they? Constantly. Constantly moving and aggressing in a spiral sort of shape, but always coming back to the same place, a little above. 
And it is because when you look down on the creation, you see the perfect loop or circle. But when you get off to one side and get out of that circle and take a look at it, you find it looks like a spiral spring because nobody ever came back to the same moment, the same time, or the same place. And then you can take out the term time and place. And Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, I think you better go upstairs. Therefore, neither corporal nor incorporal, but comparable to the sun and the stars, there are products of an immaterial substance. The soul body, which human beings as well as spirit possesses, is of a shining nature. Only man may dull it down. The vehicle of the soul is contained within the material body of man. It breathes life into the lifeless and soulless physical organism and contains the harmony of the latter. The life principle of man is the inner being which produces the activity of life in the organism. The inner man <coughs> consists of an intelligent, subda intelligent substance and an immaterial, transcendental material body. Why do they call it transcendental? Because it has consciousness in it, which is of the Creator. But isn't that a wonderful thing? To think that after all the misuse we've given it, after all the corruption that we've exposed it to, after all the willfulness we have shown, after all the violations we have gone through of the laws of creation, there is something which we can't remove, and that's the consciousness that was of the Father Creator. Whether we like it or not, we can't do it. Because if we did, death would ensue immediately, our transition. The visible material form is the product and the image of the interior man. The external form consists of the animal, the unintellectual, gross material body. Here again is where it is brought out. We are not trying to produce saints out of grasshoppers. We're trying to conquer the animal that carries us around because that's what it is. And that's what we are. Until we have gone through the necessary spiritual development in order that we too have transformed and given way to the consciousness within our own cell structure. And it becomes totally light. by the process of purification of the gross matter, material and the ethereal body, a separation of living substance and dead matter is effected, and thus man may, redeem, may render himself capable of having relation with pure spirit and consciousness. And how many times have you seen people come in here and start to get someplace near the reality of understanding what the light of Christ was really all about, the Christos, and the first thing that happened, they got themselves a great big cold that lasted, what they call the cold anyway, and it lasted for two or three weeks. 
after that was over with, why they began to settle down and everything started to work very nicely. They even began to enjoy life, even. Of course, that's not entirely kosher, but there is much to say about life spirit and its power to visualize the blood through breathing. Mm, that's a strange way to say it, isn't it? Visualize the blood through the breathing. When we bring life into something, it starts to live, doesn't it? And without our attention to it, it wouldn't live, would it? Someplace our consciousness has to be with this, or otherwise it doesn't live. We may not do it on a strictly subjective level, but it's there, <coughs> nevertheless. When this happens, there's a vitalizing effect, and it really becomes the carrier of much life. And in various parts of our studies, you'll find that physiologically as well as psychologically, there is an effect on our beings by breathing. Because most people don't breathe. After all, breathing can be expanded and explained from either a chemical or a physiological standpoint of view, or from the spiritual or psychic standpoint of view. Call attention to the fact that to emphasize the chemical nature of breathing, or in other words, solely from the materialistic point of view, is a grave error, as this ignores totally the life force, and it does not have its full effect. Or from the other side, spiritually, taking it entirely, this is a great error because we are not giving consciousness to its chemical function. Either one of these in an extended form can create various forms of the foundation or root of insanity. Yoga systems of breathing give great emphasis to the spiritual effects and those who outline those early systems of breathing for people of India and other nearby oriental countries were wise enough to understand, however, that deep breathing and proper breathing had a considerable effect upon the chemical composition of the body and upon the health. They were also wise enough not to give any emphasis to this point, but to speak only of the spiritual effects of long breathing exercises accompanied with a considerable amount of spiritual meditation. We may judge from what is said in the yoga systems that the majority of these people took up such a system of study were more interested in some form of rapid spiritual development than in improved health for they had started to disregard the vehicle which carried them around. Looking at their living condition from our modern standpoint of view, it would seem to us that the very opposite should have been true and that they should have given far more thought to hygiene than they did. Sanitation and health are necessary for a spiritual nature to be developed and for a balanced man to exist. However, very generally throughout the Orient, man seems to appease his dissatisfaction with life by trying to raise himself up spiritually and ignore his physical body. The poorer the country, the worse the health and sanitation conditions the more these people gave thought to spiritual superiority and attempted to rise 
above their sorbic condition by ignoring them. Famine and pestilence seem to follow the work of the land. As, some, as a source of vitality in the blood cells and the others result in the vital consciousness to the entire body, come from breathing throughout the lungs, throughout, the lungs are the instrument through which it comes. And in them are, uh, exists a symbol that is very much like a tree. For if we look at the composition and form of the lungs, we find that it is like a tree and its branches. And it is also true that man's divine consciousness only comes and is existently and consciously aware of it when he has fulfilled the cycle of the tree of life. We are frankly told by medical science and by chemists that if we breathe contaminated air or poisonous air, which we're all doing these days, into our lungs, we do several things. We do not only devitalize the blood, but we affect the consciousness of the body in its individual cells and in its collective form of self-consciousness. Second, we cause the mind and the brain to become disorganized in their function, and we bring about a lack of coordination between the brain and the mental activities of the human body. I wish they'd remember that out there, some of the things they're doing. A form of temporary insanity due to the, for due to the form of temporary paralysis and a lack of coordination in mental and uh, sympathetic nerve systems function is one of the early stages of poisonous breathing. On the other hand, you can take so much air in that you get drunk. You will, very definitely. Much was learned in this regard during the World War One. World War One, when poisonous gases were introduced for the first time in a scientific manner. There were many forms of poisons used to contaminate the air for different purposes. Despite what many people think. The average poison gas was not intended to destroy life, but merely to make the living individual incapable of functioning properly for its time being. The high value placed upon the so-called war prisoners that were exchanged during the armies, between armies, made it necessary to preserve life more often than destroy it. A living prisoner, even though he were unconscious at the time, was of far more value than a dead one. Rather strange way to barter in life, isn't it? The energy that constitutes the vital life force exists and is one of the big problems that science has to solve. This energy is of a divine nature. In other words, it comes out of the mind of the Father, the being of the Father, and of such a high rate of vibration that it is above and beyond anything of the ordinary electrical nature. It is, or of course, about, above, beyond anything of a chemical nature. For it is the foundation of the material which constitutes the chemical world. Its rate of vibrations are so near to those of the consciousness that unquestionably the divine consciousness is absorbed into the human system at the same time that the life force is absorbed out of the atmosphere to take it through the breathing processes and channels of the body. We find, therefore, that in breathing, man is attuning himself or chemically and physiologically harmonizing himself, one might use the term harmonizing, with divine consciousness. And each deep breath helps to develop a certain amount of realization 
not God realization, but realization of the existence of energy and vital forces within the body. And each cell of the blood uh, is affected by it, and therefore in each cell of the physiological system we have a new sensitivity is experienced. For this reason, breathing has a very important relationship to cosmic consciousness and the development of the cosmic reality. It has an important bearing, therefore, upon the development of mind and brain and body, all three in one. The more closely we are mentally and physically attuned to the original creation, the more of the divine consciousness will enter into our system when we breathe deeply and with concentration and meditation. The ancients who studied the yoga system believed that breathing exercises accompanied by meditation would bring about the spiritual development. Some of the modern exponents of this system have no idea about the necessity of being properly harmonized and properly tuned with the cosmic, both mentally and in action before beginning such exercise. Therefore lies the great error of their method. We may take a young child or a young man or woman from high school and teach him to breathe deeply and using even the complex and very extreme breathing exercises of the East and may teach him or her to meditate upon some spiritual thought or <coughs> godly thing and during each period of breathing this should be carried on, but no matter how perfectly these young people may follow these instructions, unless they have had some preliminary instruction and guidance and help that can lift their own consciousness up to some higher degree of cosmic atuma before beginning such an exercise, they will not receive from the breathing and meditation the cosmic benefits that they have anticipated. The whole su object of a system or course of instruction in the mystics or in psychic development or any other system is to bring about a gradual attunement with all that is, with the cosmic, so that our breathing and concentration and meditation have a functional value. Breathing alone or meditation alone or the two in combination are not sufficient. For we have to be unlearned of all that we have learned in school. Another effect of cosmic attunement is the connection in the connection with the health. The higher we lift our consciousness, the higher the breathing contact develops with the more pure form of cosmic relationship. Health is as much dependent upon the divine energy of life, spirit, being thoroughly infused in the human body as it is dependent upon anything else. Proper eating or proper sleeping or proper ways of living generally are not sufficient. There is such a magnificent difference between a person living normally and in just normal good health and a person whose health is abundantly good and so recreative. Thus the magnetic personality that we speak about is built. Inclusively radiant that the two forms of health cannot be compared. One who is just normally healthy has a little or no reserve or if there is any constitutional reserve, it is easily and quickly wiped out by a short period of anything in the way of a disorder. Such persons seldom survive these disorders or the outer reactions. The onslaught on the system without a great struggle and a long and tedious application for the reassociation with their healthy state. The person, on the other hand, who is radiant and abundantly healthy 
have enormous reserve powers and a great storehouse of recreative energy, which of course is unbounded. Even when operations or other things are necessary on an emergency, destruction to living tissue is indulged in, the healing goes on very rapidly, and the high potential of the blood brings about a rapid recovery. For if you cannot recover in the body, how will you recover from shock experienced during the development of your mind and being? Thus cosmic develop is, development is not wholly and purely a mystical thing unless we include all the divine principles as being mystical. The laws of mysticism apply as well as those of the occult to everything in life. But from the Eastern point of view, the mystic, mysticism applies only to those extreme spiritual conditions which are entirely separate from the physical existence. And this, of course, is solely due because man in the Christian church has developed into godhood. Yes, Jim, you can go upstairs now. You're excused. Therefore, one may easily say that the Oriental point of view is fantastically one, and we should not be surprised to find that all of their mysticism tends toward the fan fantastic, fan fanatical practice, and that those who claim the uttermost of mystical development are usually poor in spiritual health and their bodies rapidly waste away. <coughs> harmony, bringing anything into harmony is going to be bring about a natural condition in which you then can work with the origin and source more readily. Of course, it is doubtful that we will gain such a tumult in a few days that we will uh, get to the point where we will lose our bodies and go up above the, the level of the uh, meditative world. There are few things in which man can be actually set down to in the way of instruction that will really bring him to this point. His greatest opportunity in gaining cosmic consciousness is forgetting all about it in doing his everyday job and performing his spiritual exercises knowing that when he's ready he will be spoken to. Don't try for goodness sake. I have seen more people trying lately to do things that they had no right to do. Try it. Because as long as you're trying, most of the real spiritual attainment won't happen. Because as long as you're trying, you're going to do it. And I've got sad news for you. You're just not going to do it. You never could, and you never will. That's for sure. It is only when man realizes that no matter how many degrees he's got after his name, that they aren't going to, they aren't going to bring him any closer to God. And it's only when they realize that they are looking or they hope they can receive something of this nature 
that they are able to reach that which when they know they don't know then they will repeat very simple because then the vacuum is fixed then they are going to find that point which they are seeking through the many channels but they do not, do not know what it's like when they get there but they will realize what it, what it is when they have received it many of our people here right in this school I've seen these things happen. I remember one person, I don't think she's here now, came in here and then the second day she was here, she came fully, almost fully into the light. You can't do that. That's not kosher. You've got to spend at least four or five years, you know. That's, that's always the case. But when you have reached that oneness and that one point where you no longer depend on anything, and you let go of the whole work, then you will have it. Then you will receive it. And you won't receive it until you do There is a statement I made some time ago that I'm just reminded of. Regardless of whether you see the step in the ladder to get there or not, step on it anyway. It will raise you up. 